Welcome into K-State Online, and uh, we come to you with some exciting news for K-State basketball after a really, you know, kind of up and down season. K-State knew that some adjustments needed to be made. Uh, maybe what they did last year to improve the roster ultimately didn't cut it with all the different personnel things that went on. K-State trying to make sure that they don't get a repeat of 2024 in 2025 because the Wildcats have landed a pretty big fish out of the transfer portal. Doug McDaniel is going to be a Wildcat. K-State was a team that was really hot on his heels, wanted him in a bad, bad way, and you can see why. I mean, he's a guy that averaged over 16 a game in the Big Ten, almost a 5-2 to two assist to turnover ratio, which is much welcomed at K-State uh, because, you know, those they didn't have a lot of those guys last year. And then the shooting is also a big boost for what the Wildcats – could use uh they struggled last year in that department you were looking around and they had tyler perry but it didn't necessarily work out on the shooting side of things so with doug mcdaniel coming to k-state and you look around he would be about three points better uh shooting wise than what the best three-point shooter arthur kaluma was on last year's team so in a lot of different areas this is a big deal for k-state but what most stands out to you about doug mcdaniel being a wildcat dy that you're basically getting your A1 priority target right out of the gate, right out of the way, um, and and hitting on it. You, you you just not everyone has the liberty and luxury of getting the absolute guy they wanted um, this early, and Kansas State's getting that done. And you're it's not like because I, I think I get in the vibe from like I guess maybe on our you know website message board and maybe for those out in the social media sphere, um, maybe I'm too online, I don't know, but that uh, they don't, that they kind of get the vibe that the staff's just going to miss and miss and miss. And, and and I get it To I don't, honestly, I don't get it, but I understand being negative after a season that didn't finish with an NCAA tournament appearance. But I mean, look at who they beat David Castillo for. Look who they beat Tyler Perry for. Look who they beat Arthur Kaluma for. Um, I'm probably even missing a few, um, even at the time that they built the initial roster. I think that uh, they were battling some teams for Cam Carter as well. Obviously, he's on his way to LSU after entering the transfer portal. I just this isn't a staff that has been not winning recruiting battles. They've they've won their share, especially against some of the big boys. I mean, yeah, you know, they beat out Kentucky for Arthur Kaluma, for example. Um, KU was in the mix for David Castillo. Um, for Doug McDaniel, he's probably, I think, in the top 10 or top 20 of transfer portal of players in the transfer portal on just about any site that you want to look at that actually assesses grades and ranks those in the transfer portal. So it's just, for me, the biggest takeaway I have is probably runs a foot to, to what many people say. It's a continuation of this recruiting, of this particular coaching staff a continuation that they can beat out the big boys for big time recruits. Um, something that didn't happen with the previous coaching staff, obviously something that just hasn't happened to, with Kansas state in general a lot. So I think this staff just shows the ability to do what a lot of basketball and football staffs haven't been able to do at Kansas state. Yeah. I think it's, I get where people are coming from where you feel like the misses pile up uh, and, and those are painful, but, and as much as I do sometimes side with those people, um, you, I mean, you would obviously like for the hit rate to be a little bit higher, but that's a lot asking for how this game works, where a lot of schools have a lot of high miss rates. You just have to make sure that you hit on enough of the right guys at the right time. And we have two seasons of Jerome Tang basketball at K-State. One, he did that, and another one, it didn't happen. And now you have another season to try and add on to that. And obviously, I think there's some learning from mistakes and and better preparing for it as well now that you have a full year under your belt. But going out and getting Doug McDaniel certainly uh, shows a commitment. And obviously, uh, they are making some strides here. And that's a big get for them. And I, I think moving forward now, it's about finding more pieces that kind of fit around it. Because in my eyes, outside of – landing Keontae Johnson in year one, and we know that there were different circumstances surrounding K-State being able to get Keontae. Doug McDaniel is easily the best pickup 
that they've gotten in this stretch of hunting in the transfer portal since Jerome Tang and his staff came here. Because I think you can probably make the argument that prior to this, Arthur Kaluma would have been there. Doug McDaniel's a better player than Arthur Kaluma, and that's not a slight to Kaluma, but players like Doug McDaniel give you a better chance to win every single college basketball game than a guy like Arthur Kaluma, who he needs other guys around him. Doug McDaniel, although it's not going to happen every time that you're out there, he is the type of player that can go ahead and single-handedly win one of those games for you. So I am excited to see what this looks like for K-State, and this is a good way to start, but obviously you have to kind of finish this thing off a little bit more. You can't just be happy that you got one big fish and move on because this roster is not in a position right now to where one big fish is going to cut it. They're still going to have some more work to do. But in terms of what McDaniel can do fitting in with a roster, uh, how do you see him fitting currently with what K-State has and what needs to be added around him? What's it's a little bit hard to gauge that when you don't know uh, what the other pieces are going to be, as you kind of asked there at the tail end of that as well. So it's like a fit. They need to fit stuff around him rather than vice versa. That's what I would say. Um, him and Day Day. And you got two really good guys to build around, I think, because Day Day really flashed at the uh, end of last season. And, you know, not a lot of size between those two. So if you, you ask me what they need, probably a little bit more size than – maybe in the backcourt or on the wing to kind of make up for the lack of size that you might have between Dede Ames and Doug McDaniel and even Quez Glover, if he is retained as well, if he sticks around. And so far he is not in the transfer portal. So I do think you need a little bit more size. And I, and I bet that's what really gets prioritized moving forward. Um, now they did have a visitor, as everyone knows, we reported Terrace Green, a uh, Terrace Green, Terrace Reed, uh, was on campus, also a Michigan transfer. Uh, I have some my doubts on whether or not he sticks with uh, – or he ends up at Kansas State too, um, even though him and Doug McDaniel were roommates. I have my doubts on that. But for those that were kind of panicking about why would we want two players from the same team on a team that was trash, I think we touched on it a little bit. Hey – you know, the last Kansas State team before Jerome Tang and Marquise Noel and Nigel Pack, and it wasn't very good. And the following year, Nigel Pack made the Final Four. Um, Marquise Noel made the Elite Eight. And two years later, Selton Miguel won an American Athletic Conference title at South Florida and became one of the best three-point shooters yeah. in the country. So, um, you know, in, in particularly, particularly in this era, I don't think sometimes when things are just bad, for a team, I don't necessarily think it's big. In some cases, it's not that they're talentless. It's that it just didn't fit. It didn't take. I think Arkansas is an example of that this past year. Yeah. I think Miami is an example of that this past year. I think Michigan is an example of that this past year. And there's probably other ones. USC, uh, the team that PK State on opening mm -hmm. night, probably an example of that. Um, so I think that's going to happen on a yearly basis for teams that sometimes it just does not take because for some reason the pieces don't fit. And I think that's more and more the case now because in the transfer portal, there, there's just not a lot of continuity. So if you put something together and for some reason, you know, it just doesn't yeah. connect, it's going to fall apart. I think that was Michigan this past year, probably for a while. Uh, you can put that on the coaching staff. You can put that onto this era of college sports where that's just going to happen because you can make an argument that it happened to North Carolina in 20 the 2022-2023 season. Yeah. The season before that they made the national title. The season after that they just made the Sweet 16 Elite 8. So it's it's going to be more volatility in results. Yeah, and I, I think it's just the distribution of talent in college basketball is wider now than it ever has been even before uh, the current NIL rules went into place that was already starting to happen. I would talk all the time people would ask, "Well, why is the why does it feel like college basketball is down?" I think it's because in your eyes, you know, you don't have as much as we hate it. Like it was better for college basketball in the regular season when Carolina and Duke and Kentucky hoarded all of the best players and they were in these pockets of teams. And so you knew like, okay, this is the, now that talent spreads out. I, I, I would implore people like, go look at how the top 10 picks in the NBA draft end up looking probably over the last five years now. Like, Anthony Edwards went to Georgia 
Georgia, they were 5-13 and 13 in the SEC the season that he was there. It didn't make Anthony Edwards any less of a good player, as we've seen now, for what he's become. And he was a good player in college, too. I mean, he was scoring almost 20 every night for Georgia. So hey, there's a lot of circumstances that go into it. And obviously, you know, we talked about Jawan Howard and, and how that coaching thing uh, went for them. So you would think you get into the right spot, things can go better for you. And we've seen that happen for guys with Jerome Tang and K-State. Marquise Noel is obviously the best example because I think if you were some other school and Marquise Noel came to play for you after that 2022 season at K-State, you're wondering, well, why do you want this guy? Like, what's the upside to this? Well, he stayed at K-State and had a different coaching situation and everything worked out around him to where he was an All-American. So I get why people would be concerned about hunting for this, but this is kind of what you have to do. It's it's how college basketball works now. I would argue college basketball is better because more talent has stayed in college for longer because of NIL. I'm, I would not disagree. I mean, I the enjoyment that I get from it is still the same. I think the household yeah. name thing might be tougher for people, but – uh, overall, I think it's going well for him. Yeah, guys are going to guys are taking longer to get to the NBA or not in a hurry to get to the NBA because they can get paid in college now. I, I think, look, not that these guys would have been good NBA players, but there's a reason why they're not, and because they stick around long enough to get found out. But guys like Hunter Dickinson, Oscar Shibway, you know, those people that were kind of they stuck around as long as they did in college mm -hmm. because they were getting paid. And in, in another world, they probably would have left earlier. That's just two examples. Um, there's probably more than more than that or whatever. But uh, you know, I the transfer portal spreads it around more, but the NIL keeps talent in college longer. A couple of quick things here as we, we close up shop. Uh Doug McDaniel last year, he had six games where he scored at least 20 points for Michigan. All of them took place in non-conference play. Now, a couple were big games against like St. John's in Florida. Uh, he had 33 twice last year. Uh, any worry about how his style will fit the Big 12 and what it can do to lead K-State? Not really. I haven't dove into the numbers that you just kind of illustrated, so it might be more of a, a discussion for or a, a statement or feelings from you. We'll see what you think about it. My thing is, this feels like the perfect guard for Jerome Tang. That's kind of where I side. This feels like a situation where I'm not like, I would not be overly surprised if it doesn't go as well as I think some people would want it to, but people should absolutely be ecstatic about Doug McDaniel coming to K-State because he's the type of player that you want in the portal. You're right. He is the type of guy for Jerome Tang. And I think that People can question the results of everything that took place uh, the past season, but in two years, what I've seen from Jerome Tang is the guy knows how to coach basketball because I think as disappointing as last season was for K-State, it was better than what it should have been in a lot of other coaching situations. Like I think he did a good job to get K-State in the right spot. So I think I'm not too worried about some of the struggles that came in the Big Ten. And ultimately, they're not really struggles. He just never had – any of those massive blow-up games uh, last season, which part of that is due to the fact that he missed some road games for Michigan because of a an odd academic thing that went down. Yeah, and look, like I understand, people were frustrated and disappointed because he didn't make the NCAA tournament. Uh, and I, you know, this is one of those scenarios where it didn't felt didn't feel like it ever took for K State this past year, and they still somehow scrambled that thing together. Turnovers notwithstanding or you know in spite of the turnovers and still what eight and ten in a pretty tough league and we talked about the teams where it didn't take man it, it imploded a lot more for teams like arkansas miami usc right so if the, like i keep keep saying like if that's what your disappointment was a, a narrow miss of the ncaa tournament then you're living right yeah if, if that's what the bad years look like then you're you're blessed and you just hope you don't have too many of them because there's really only one school in America that isn't missing NCAA tournaments in their bad years, and that's KU. Um, that's, I mean, that's why um, this is the last thing I'll say. People won't care to hear, yeah. but like, that's why I will contend that KU is probably the best job in the country because we've seen Duke implode and miss the tournament. We've seen North Carolina do it. We've seen Kentucky do it. We've seen all of these big time schools. There's only one that hasn't. 
And I think that now what you have to go into and to become a steady program and what Jerome Tang envisions K-State being is you just can't have that happen too terribly often. If like we go through a five-year stretch where we see K-State only miss the tournament that one time, that's going to be okay. Now, if it's like every other year you're doing this, uh, people are going to get a little antsy and agitated about it. But I think bringing in a guy like Doug McDaniel shows that K-State has not only the inside commitment, but also the outside commitment with, commitment with the factors that matter now in college recruiting, specifically the transfer portal, to try and ensure that 2024 does not happen too often under Jerome Tank. And even in this era, the current landscape of sports and how it works and and really the, the playing field kind of getting leveled, so to speak, in terms in regards to Kansas, even they just had a year where they had the, what, the most losses since 1989 in a regular season, um, an early exit of the Big 12 tournament, getting completely blasted in the second round, um, getting completely blasted a couple times during the season, somehow beat UConn, somehow beat Houston. But uh, aside from that, um, it was by their standards, by their expectations, a down year as well. So and to me, I, I am very stubborn on this idea. I think it is the result of what the current landscape is. And, man, putting together dynasties, stringing together year after year after year is just going to be more difficult, which, to be honest, um, puts it what UConn is doing right now into, like, it shows you how impressive that is because no one else is getting close to that. And in this era – what they're doing right now is even harder. Yeah, it's true. In an era where it feels like the level of play is much more even for everybody, they've somehow found a way to put themselves worlds above everybody else, something that you know you didn't even feel like happened in previous years. So we'll see uh, what comes next for K-State, but they at least have the first big fish of what they hope to be a couple and set the foundation for what is uh, likely to be an improved 2025 season for the Wildcats, but they get a big guard in Doug McDaniel and uh, he will be in purple next season. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Head over to kstateonline.com for more so you're in the know with the transfer portal and everything going on with K-State basketball as they try to build a winning roster for the next season and also uh, the K-State football nuggets that come your way as well. So that'll do it for this edition of the KSO Show. We are out of here and we will be back again tomorrow with more news on the Cats.